My name is David Schwartz. I'm CTO of Ripple, co-creator of the XRP Ledger. Been working on Bitcoin, XRP Ledger, and blockchain technologies for about a decade now. Ripple, the company I work for, has over 500 employees in nine global offices. We describe our vision as enabling the world to move value like information moves today, or the Internet of Value. If you think about moving money versus moving information, like comparing an international payment to email, the differences are quite stark. Email has a universal namespace, so I can just ask you your email address. I don't have to care what email provider you use or what APIs or what technology you use to access it. Moving money is just the opposite. You know, do you have Venmo? No, I have PayPal. Oh, PayPal doesn't work in my country. Do you have Zelle? What's Zelle? I don't know. That, that human effort to make a payment is, is just, it's got to go. That inter well, so what we're looking for is the internet of value where, that, where payment is uh, as seamless and as nice as an experience as sending information. We describe our mission, sort of what we're working on every day, as enabling payments everywhere, every way, for everyone. So just taking that pain out of getting money to move from one place to another. Ripple basically has two portions of the company, RippleNet and RippleX. RippleX is the open source development portion of the company, working on helping people to understand and use blockchain technologies and lower some of those barriers to entry. Uh, RippleNet is a payments network. It's built for financial institutions. It has payments infrastructure, end-to-end -end messaging delivered by Ripple. And XRP is a digital asset, widely used by individuals and companies. It settles on a public ledger in just a few seconds at very low cost. So RippleNet is a global payments network built by Ripple uh, in over 55 countries with over 120 20 currency pairs. Key partners include companies like MoneyGram, American Express, Asimo, and so on. This is a modern payment system built on blockchain technology that allows end-to-end -end payment negotiation, fee discovery, pathfinding, multi-hop payments, and so on. And it's sort of agnostic to how the payment settles. It can settle with a digital asset. It can settle through a traditional Forex desk or through correspondent banking. It's agnostic to how the payment's going to settle and allows financial institutions to choose the settlement method that works best for the particular payment. XRP is a universal vehicle of value. This is one of the tools that Ripple is using to solve the international payment challenge. This is a digital asset that moves value between two parties in just a few seconds in a, in a neutral system. It doesn't have an operator. It doesn't have a central counterparty. It's censorship resistant. It's fast and reliable. XRP lives on the XRP ledger, just like uh, Bitcoin lives on the Bitcoin blockchain. The XRP ledger has some very interesting properties, though. It's very cheap, a tiny, tiny fraction of, its, of a penny. It's very fast. Payments can be fully confirmed in less than 10 seconds. It's available on over 100 exchanges and traded on over 200 currency pairs. So this is an open source decentralized technology that provides a digital asset that provides scalability, speed, and low cost. It enables the full settlement of transactions for fractions of a penny. The XRP Ledger doesn't just host XRP, though. It has a tremendous amount of built-in functionality. It's a sort of fixed function blockchain. It's not like Ethereum where you can add your own functionality yet. There's been work to add that feature. But it does have very sophisticated fixed function transactors. And a major feature is issued assets and the decentralized exchange. So issued assets are assets other than XRP that have some counterparty. You can set credit and balance limits. You can decide what issued assets you want to hold. There are order books so people who want to trade one asset for another can trade them. And cross-asset payments work using the liquidity in the order book. So if there's someone who's willing to trade US dollars for Bitcoin, then you can pay US dollars and deliver Bitcoin or vice versa. And the network will figure out how to make that payment work for you. And payments have incremental execution, so you don't have to buy down a single order book and get a bad rate for a large payment. Payments can execute across multiple order books concurrently. These are features that have been around in the XRP ledger since 2012. These are not, uh, these are not new features. So these issued currencies uh, exist as a balance between two accounts. Like if I have $50 at, the, at a bank, we think of the bank as owing me $50. It's a positive $50 balance for me and a negative $50 balance for the bank. And if you trust the same bank I do, then I can make a payment to you by doing something that lowers my balance and increases your balance. And now the bank owes me less money and you more money. And we can use different banks, and this still works as long as they're liquidity. The payment ripples through the different institutions that hold the assets and issue the assets. Again, this is functionality that the XRP Ledger has had since 2012, including functions like credit limits, on ledger settlement, and so on. So let's talk about stablecoins and CBDCs. What are they? 
These are digital assets pegged to fiat that would be issued by some sort of a reputable financial institution, in the ideal case, a central bank. So why a central bank? If you use dollars, you're trusting the Federal Reserve anyway. If the Federal Reserve owes you dollars, well, that's what dollars are. You can't get any more dollar than that. So that eliminates um, a trust problem because it puts a trust in a party that you necessarily trust anyway. So let's look at some of the possible approaches for issuing stable coins and CBDCs. There are a couple of possible models. The first model is the non-ledger model, by which I mean not using any blockchain or any of the newer technologies. This is the traditional mechanism where accounts have balances and you trust counterparties to tell you what your balances are. You have legal recourse against them, obviously, if they give incorrect balances. A public ledger system trades multiple assets on a decentralized network. Multiple issuers could issue stable coins or CBDCs onto a public ledger like the XRP ledger. A hybrid public ledger approach uses a public ledger for settlement, but doesn't attempt to send every transaction to the public ledger. You could imagine if you were doing high traffic volumes, hundreds of transactions per second or more, you probably don't want to try to push every single one of those transactions down to a public ledger. In a private ledger approach, it's like a blockchain, but it's not decentralized. So here, central banks or asset issuers would operate their own private ledgers that would give some of the benefits of public ledgers, but not all of them, but avoiding some of the disadvantages of private le public ledgers. So what is the advantages of each approach? The non-ledger approach is simple and scalable. It's what everybody's already doing. If your bank tells you that they have a balance, they're not using any of these new ledger technologies. Public ledgers provide guaranteed fairness, and they're interoperable without controllers. So what that means is if the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank issue onto, let's say, the same public ledger like the XRP ledger, there's guaranteed fairness on the ledger side. The ledger isn't going to favor one or the other. Everybody knows what rules they're going to get. And, and it's not the case that everybody who wants to use the public ledger has to trust every issuer. You have to trust the issuers whose assets you hold and deal with, but the system itself has that guaranteed fairness. A hybrid public ledger approach is scalable and provides low risk. The two types of risk that it best minimizes are overnight risk. You imagine if you used a more traditional system, you might have a whole bunch of payments that settle on Friday, and you can't actually make the payment to ultimately settle between the financial institutions until Monday. If you go back to a public ledger and settle with a stable coin or CBDC, you avoid that overnight risk. And you can also avoid the sort of cascading default. If you imagine a system that settles only every day, you may have a situation where a bank doesn't have enough float to make all of their outbound payment commitments if all of their inbound commitments fail. So if A fails to pay B, B may be unable to pay C and D, leading to cascading default and systemic risk. If you settle back to a public ledger, let's say every minute or even every hour, you can avoid that risk of cascading default without having to have an entire day or worse, an entire weeks of payments flows as float. You just keep enough float in case your sort of transactions in flight don't settle. The private ledger approach allows foreign assets and it's secure and scale and reliable. So you get the benefits of public ledgers. Public ledgers don't stop. And public ledgers allow different assets issued by different parties to interoperate. So you do get those advantages. You get interoperability. If different um, central banks or different issuers use compatible private ledger systems, you can easily interact with all of them. There are, of course, disadvantages to all approaches. And no, no approach is necessarily better than every other in all cases. The non-ledger approach requires, requires complete trust. Whoever operates the system, you completely trust. You completely trust your bank with your bank balance. That may be okay because you can sue them and there's a legal regime, but that's what you're ultimately relying on to keep the system secure. And they're not interoperable. Banks don't interoperate with each other. Different completely private non-ledger systems just don't interoperate very well. That's part of the problem with payments today. Public ledgers have limited throughput. You can't dump a thousand transactions per second to any blockchain. And even if you could, nobody else could. There's no system that's going to scale better than that. And this is kind of a fundamental problem. It's not a technological problem. The problem with public ledgers is every transaction imposes some cost on everyone who uses the system. So you can't monopolize the system and dump hundreds of, of your own transactions per second to it. It just doesn't work. The hybrid ledger approach is complicated. And it does require some trust. So while you can settle back to a public ledger, you will have to have some sort of intermediary trust. You're going to have to do netting with your partners. You're going to have to settle back to the public ledger only periodically. There are some technological solutions to that, but that's at minimum going to make it more complicated. And of course, the private ledger does require significant trust. If you imagine that the Federal Reserve operates a private ledger that financial institutions in the US use, that's probably fine. If you're in a financial institution in the US, you're trusting the Fed already anyway. But it doesn't, it doesn't allow participation or control by parties that don't already have very, very significant trust. So 
it's only useful if those ultimately trusted parties decide to build those technologies. So what's the opportunity? So stable coins and CBDCs can make domestic payments better. And that's extremely important because if domestic payments aren't good, international payments can't possibly be good. Every international payment, at least a retail or consumer one or anything that's not directly between the largest banks, there's going to be a domestic payment on each side. If I'm going to pay a vendor in Italy, there's going to be a domestic payment once my funds get to Italy to that vendor. And so making domestic payments better is essential if we're going to make everything else better too. Um, XRP is an efficient bridge between two assets, including stable coins and CBDCs. It's neutral, it's jurisdictionless, it's censorship resistant, it doesn't have any central counterparty that you need to trust, so it can be used as a sort of universal bridge. And blockchains are what provide that level playing field so that banks and regulators can live in a multi-asset future without having to deal with hundreds of different APIs, hundreds of different uh, controllers or different rule sets. Thank you.